Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I hope you've all been having the best day. This video is scheduled to go live on Halloween day, so happy Halloween. Today we are talking about a very disturbing case that took place in October of 1988 in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And the person who was responsible for the crimes in today's case was absolutely obsessed with the Friday the 13th movies, really all horror movies, but especially Friday the 13th. And he wasn't just obsessed with the movies, he idolized the main villain in the Friday the 13th movies, Jason Voorhees. He constantly talked about Jason. He had Jason dolls, Jason posters, Jason costumes and masks and weapons. He literally wanted to become Jason Voorhees. And lots of people like horror movies, so the fact that he really liked horror movies is not the issue here. What made this obsession unsettling was the fact that this person was also suffering from a lot of mental health issues and he was having a lot of really dark and disturbing thoughts about killing people. And he was very vocal about these thoughts. He would constantly talk about all this to his friends and he would say that he really wanted to kill someone one day and he wanted to know how it felt. And he would talk about the ways that he would go about murdering people. And eventually he just started playing out this really sadistic fantasy over and over again in his head. He fantasized about chasing down a teenage girl and brutally killing her. And he wouldn't rest until he got to live out that fantasy. And sadly, this did lead to the horrific murder of an 18 year old girl. And this all completely threw the town of Greenfield into a state of panic. This all took place right before Halloween. And that just added an extra layer of creepiness to the situation. And the entire community was worried that the killer would strike again on Halloween night. So yeah, let's just go ahead and jump right into the case. But before we do, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Factor. Factor is a meal service that is now owned by HelloFresh and they truly have something for everyone. The Factor meals come straight to your door. They're already cooked, fresh, and ready for you to eat. It only takes two minutes to heat up in the microwave and you are ready to enjoy. Factor meals are always fresh, they're never frozen, and they have a team of gourmet chefs creating each and every meal. And literally everything I've tried from Factor so far has been absolutely delicious. And my kids love Factor as well. We are a super busy family and there are nights where me and my husband just don't have time to cook. So instead of ordering pizza or something like that, my kids can just go grab a factor meal out of the fridge. And it's so nice. The meals are so easy to heat that my kids can do pretty much the whole thing by themselves. And they have a dietitian approved nutritious meal in just two minutes. My favorite thing that I've tried from factor so far is probably the maple barbecue ground beef with the roasted potatoes and green beans. It is so good. And they even have protein shakes. This week I tried the pumpkin spice one and it was really good. In fact, Factor also makes it super easy for me to keep up with my calorie intake and my nutrition because each of their meals is 550 calories or less. But what I love most about Factor is the convenience. All the meals are just so quick and easy to prepare. Everything comes straight to your door. Everything is fresh and you just have to heat them up in the microwave for two minutes. That's it. And you guys have heard me talk about Green Chef on this channel before and Green Chef is also owned by HelloFresh. And now you guys can enjoy both brands all at a discount when you go to Factor75 com and you use my code summer 50 you will get 50 percent off your first factor box thanks again to factor for sponsoring this video and for providing me and my family with quick easy delicious meals and now let's jump into the case on October 24th, 1988, in Greenfield, Massachusetts, an 18-year-old college student named Cheryl Gregory was returning home from a full morning of classes. Cheryl lived at home with her parents and her twin sister, Sharon, and both girls were attending Greenfield Community College. That day had started out just like every other day. Cheryl's parents had left early for work that morning, and Cheryl headed out to her first class at around 8.45 a.m., leaving her twin sister, Sharon, at home alone. Sharon didn't have to head to class until a little bit later that morning, so when Cheryl left, Sharon was just getting out of the shower and she was still getting ready for the day. Later that afternoon at around 12.30 p.m., Cheryl arrived back home from school and she walked right into a horror scene. She opened the front door and immediately noticed a large pool of blood at the base of the stairs that trailed all the way up the staircase. So Cheryl followed the trail of blood up the stairs and it led right to the upstairs bathroom. And when she walked in, she found her twin sister dead in the bathtub and her body had been totally mutilated. Sharon had been stabbed multiple times all over her body, all over her face, her head, her torso, her throat had also been cut. Now at first, because Sharon's body was in such an awful state, Cheryl couldn't really tell 
what had happened to her. Her first thought did not go to murder. So she thought that maybe Sharon had done this to herself. Maybe she had killed herself. So Cheryl runs out of the bathroom and she goes downstairs and she immediately calls for help. The police rush over to the Gregory house and they walk into this absolutely horrific scene and they take one look at Sharon's body and they know that this is a homicide. Sharon had not done this to herself. Something very violent and disturbing had happened to Sharon. Cheryl was in shock and she was completely distraught, but she did manage to tell police that she thought she knew who had done this to her sister. Sharon had recently become very creeped out by a guy named Mark. She had told Cheryl that Mark had been making her feel really uncomfortable lately and he would stare at her and say weird things to her and he just really creeped her out. Mark wasn't really a friend of Sharon's, but he hung out with some of the same people that Sharon hung out with. Now, Cheryl couldn't remember Mark's last name, but she did know where he lived. She had been to his house before with Sharon. So police put Cheryl in their patrol car and she guided them straight over to Mark's house. And when they arrived, they realized that they were at the home of the Branch family. And the Mark that Cheryl was talking about was Mark Branch, a 19 year old local with a long history of serious mental health issues. Now we don't know a ton of details about Mark's childhood, but we do know that he grew up in Greenfield, Massachusetts, and he seemed to have a pretty good home life. His parents were nice and loving and they really cared about Mark and they just wanted to do their best to make sure that he had everything he needed in life. They lived in a really nice area of Greenfield in a beautiful home, but all was not perfect for Mark. He had a pretty terrible time at school. He had a hard time fitting in with other kids his age. He was described as being socially awkward and he really didn't interact with a lot of people because he just really didn't know what to say. So he just didn't say anything. And so eventually he became known as sort of a loner. And and this made Mark stand out and not in a good way. He was singled out and picked on from a very young age. The kids just thought that he was weird. And because of this, Mark was bullied by the other kids at school. They teased him. They would deliberately leave him out of like group activities. They would go out of their way to make sure that Mark felt as alone in the world as possible. And things did not get better as Mark got older. By the time he started high school at Greenfield High, he had managed to make a small group of friends. So he wasn't completely isolated, but he was still picked on and bullied a lot by the other kids. Now, in addition to Mark being seen as socially awkward and a loner, he was also bullied because of his obsession with horror movies. Mark was absolutely obsessed with all things horror. He loved Michael Myers. He loved Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street, but his absolute favorite horror character was Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th movies. And according to Mark's parents, he had had this obsession with Jason in particular since he was in second grade and the obsession just continued to grow as he got older. And this case is probably going to make some people pretty angry because the fact that Mark was really into horror was blamed for what he goes on to do. I read through a lot of old newspaper articles on this case and the media was really pushing the narrative that this was all because of horror movies. In one article, the writer even poses the question, should the horror industry have to suffer some consequences because of what Mark Mark goes on to do. And I just want to say for the record that I personally do not believe that horror movies or video games or music can turn someone into a killer. There has to be some sort of serious mental illness at play. So the fact that Mark was really into horror would have just been a fleeting mention in this video. But later when we get more into the case, you'll see why I had to elaborate because it does come back up later in the case, especially his obsession with Jason. And a lot of you are probably huge horror movie fans. I am a huge fan of horror movies. In fact, a lot of Mark's favorites are also some of my favorites. Halloween, the first one, is my all-time favorite horror movie. In my opinion, it does not get much scarier than Michael Myers. But Mark's affinity for like all things horror and gore goes beyond just being a fan of the genre or the movies themselves. He was a fan of the villains in these movies. He idolized characters like Jason and Michael Myers. He wanted to be like them and dress like them. They were like heroes to Mark. And he started to collect masks and clothing and shoes so that he could dress up like characters from these movies. He had multiple hockey masks and he did not play hockey, by the way. These were all collected because of his obsession with Jason. He had clothing and combat boots like Jason and he had tons of posters and dolls of Jason. He even started collecting weapons that he saw the characters use in the movies. He 
truly had an unhealthy obsession. And if you are not familiar with the Friday the 13th movies, Jason Voorhees is the killer in these movies. There's like a billion of them. And in the movies, Jason's character is teased and bullied relentlessly when he's a kid. And so his victims in the movies are usually teenagers. And so it's thought because of this that Mark especially connected with Jason's character because he saw himself in Jason. They both got teased. They both were bullied. They were both made to feel like they were less than. And over time, Mark started having some very disturbing thoughts and he would tell his friends about these thoughts too. He would talk openly to them about how he wanted to kill someone one day and he would elaborate on how he would do it, the type of weapons that he would use, all the different methods that he could go about using. This was his ultimate fantasy. This was something that Mark really wanted to do one day for real and he was just openly telling his friends about it. What Mark is telling his friends is very alarming and super disturbing. I don't know a lot about Mark's friends so I don't know if they just didn't take him seriously or maybe they knew he was serious but thought that he would just never go through with it. They did know that he was struggling a lot with his mental health so maybe they thought that this was just something he was talking about but it was obvious that as Mark was getting older his thoughts and his fantasies were just getting darker and darker and his mental health was just steadily declining and all of this sort of came to a head when Mark started high school. He started to harass some of the kids at the school, mostly focusing on the girls. Mark made a list of the girls that he liked in the school and he would go down the list and call them one by one and make threats to them. He would say sexual, very explicit things over the phone, but he would also tell them that he wanted to kill them. And he would describe in detail about how he wanted to do it. He would also write really disturbing notes to these girls and he would be very sexual in these notes and he would, again, and talk about how he wanted to murder them and the ways that he wanted to do it. And this is all happening back in the 1980s. And I just kept thinking while I was researching this case, how different this would have all went down if this happened today. So they ended up calling Mark's parents into the school and they sat down and had a meeting with them and told them everything that was going on. And Mark's parents took it really seriously. Like I said, Mark's parents do seem like very caring parents and they truly do just want what's best for their son. And they can see that he is really struggling. He had been suffering with his mental health since he was very, very young and he'd been under the care of counselors and therapists for most of his life at this point, but his parents could see that things were just getting worse and worse as he was getting older. And so in 1984, after this meeting with the school, they ended up pulling Mark out of Greenfield High and they placed him in an alternative school called New Salem Academy. Just to kind of remove him from the situation, he would have a fresh start, you know, kind of reset. So now Mark is in this new school and his parents are really hopeful that being in a new setting and still going to therapy, you know, all of his counseling sessions, that it would kind of get Mark back on track but that is not at all what happened. The threats just continued and they actually escalated once he arrived at New Salem Academy. A girl at the school who wanted to remain anonymous noticed Mark and she noticed that he was new and he was all alone and she felt bad for him. So one day she decided that she was gonna try to talk to him and you know, just try to be his friend. She just was trying to be nice. But Mark did not accept her friendship at all. He started making threats towards her, the same type of threats that he'd gotten in trouble for back at Greenfield High. He told her that he wanted to kill her. He would describe in detail how he wanted to do it. But then he took it one step further. And one day he stuck a photo of the girl on her locker with a scalpel through it as like a visual aid for what he wanted to do to her. And he threatened at least one other girl at the school with a knife. So it was pretty obvious that Mark wasn't going to miraculously get better and less aggressive just by removing him from Greenfield High. The first girl, the one that he put the photo on her locker, the one that tried to be his friend, she hadn't bullied Mark at all. She hadn't said anything mean to him. She was trying to be his friend. She was trying to be nice. And for Mark to respond to her gesture of kindness with such serious aggression, it just shows that he had a serious, serious problem and he really needed help. Not that anyone deserves to be threatened like that. I'm not saying that the kids at Greenfield deserved being threatened, but it's obvious that this problem goes beyond a toxic situation at school. Mark is becoming deeply 
mentally disturbed. And honestly, his crimes in this case were just bound to happen. He was like a ticking time bomb. So once again, his parents pull him from school, but this time they admitted him into McLean Hospital in Belmont. And he stayed there for about a year in the wing for the mentally ill youth. And once he was out of McLean Hospital, his parents enrolled him at a place called New Dimensions, which was a school for kids who had like behavioral and emotional issues. And this was a live-in school. Mark lived in a dorm on campus and he would travel home to Greenfield every weekend. And this was the last school that he attended. He did go on to graduate from New Dimensions. And after graduation, Mark started working part-time at a supermarket called Stop and Shop. And he would also occasionally help out at the local movie rental store. And he actually did manage to hold down these two jobs. And he was even maintaining friendships with some of his old friend group. And they would get together and hang out quite a bit. There were two friends that he hung out with the most and that was Scott Landry and Derek Ianelli. And they could see that Mark was still struggling with his mental health and they both felt really bad for Mark. They had been friends with him since elementary school and they had watched Mark get bullied for years. And so they hoped by, you know, hanging out with him and including him and kind of keeping him busy and keeping him in the loop with the friend group that this would help his mental state. And they would hang out almost every single day. But Mark would still bring up murder quite often. He continued to talk about his fantasy of murdering women and how exhilarating it would be. And this is probably another parallel to Jason. If you are familiar with the Friday the 13th movies, you know that Jason is kind of known for his crazy methods of killing his victims. He gets pretty creative with it. And Mark was always fantasizing about the different ways that he would kill his victims, which weapons he would use, etc, etc. So this is probably another way that Mark was trying to be like Jason Voorhees. And even though some of the things that Mark was saying were very shocking and, you know, unsettling to hear, Scott and Derek were used to hearing Mark talk like this. He had talked like this for years, so it wasn't something that was like out of the norm. But behind the scenes, Mark's dark thoughts were escalating and he was inching closer and closer towards living out his sick fantasies. According to Mark himself, he attempted to live out his fantasy on Halloween night, 1987. He said that he got dressed up like his favorite horror character, Jason Voorhees. He put on one of the mini hockey masks that he owned and he grabbed a knife from his collection and he headed over to Greenfield Middle School and hid and waited for a girl to walk by. And when a young girl finally did pass by and Mark saw that she was all alone, he jumped out of the darkness and lunged at her. The girl ran away as fast as she could and Mark started chasing after her with his knife. But thankfully he tripped and fell and the girl managed to get away. And apparently this incident was not reported. Now, Sharon and Cheryl Gregory were not friends with Mark. They were more like friends by association. They had some mutual friends. So they were kind of floating around in the same general friend group as Mark. Cheryl and Sharon had become friends with Mark's friend, Scott. So in the months leading up to the murder, there were several instances where Mark was hanging out with Cheryl and Sharon, but they didn't really talk much. Mark was just sort of there. And Cheryl and Sharon's boyfriends were also friends with Scott and some of his friends as well. And so this is how Mark became acquainted with Cheryl and Sharon. They did attend the same high school for a little while, but it seems like they didn't really know each other when they were in high school. Now, when Mark did decide to talk to Cheryl and Sharon when they were all hanging out, he would talk all about his love of horror and gore and his obsession with Jason. He even told Cheryl all about his failed attempt to kill that girl on Halloween night the previous year. And he told Cheryl that if he hadn't have fallen down, he would have caught that girl and stabbed her to death. And he also told Cheryl Cheryl that he planned to get all dressed up like Jason and try it again that Halloween in 1988. Now, according to Mark's friend, Derek Ianelli, in August of 1988, so just two months before Sharon's murder, the topic of Mark's history of mental illness and the fact that he'd stayed a year in a psychiatric hospital came up one night while everyone was hanging out and Sharon and Cheryl were present for this. Or I'm not really sure why he goes on to do this next thing, but Mark took one of the psychological profiles that the hospital had given to his mother and he brought it to show some of his friends while they were all hanging out that night. And Cheryl took a big interest in this report. She wanted to know exactly what the doctors had to say about Mark. So she asked Mark if she can take the report home with her so that she can read it more thoroughly. This thing is several pages long and 
they're at a party and she doesn't really want to just sit there and read all night. And Mark actually did agree to this, but he tells her, do not let anyone else read it and you need to burn it when you're done. So Cheryl agrees and she takes the report home with her and she reads it, but she does not burn it. Instead, she cut off the top of the report, the part that had Mark's name on it. She likely did this because she probably didn't really intend to burn the profile. So she cut his name off so that it would hide who the report was about in case anyone happened to find it. So now we're going to jump ahead two months to October 22nd, 1988. Sharon Gregory is at home and she gets a call from Scott Landry and Scott wants to know if her sister Cheryl still has Mark's psychological profile because if she does and she hasn't burned it yet, Mark wants it back. So Sharon goes to Cheryl's room and she asks her, you know, hey, do you still have that report on Mark? And Cheryl says, yeah, I still have it. It's right there on my floor. Cheryl had left the report just lying on the floor of her bedroom and she had probably forgotten all about it by that point. So Sharon tells Scott, yes, Cheryl still has the report. It's lying on her bedroom floor. Scott says, okay, we'll tell her that she needs to get it back to Mark. So Sharon says, okay, I'll let her know. And they hang up. Now at some point in the days leading up to Sharon's murder, she started feeling a noticeable shift in Mark's behavior towards her. He had started making her feel really uncomfortable. He was looking at her differently. She was catching him staring at her in this really unsettling way. And she was uncomfortable enough that she mentioned this to her sister. And according to Cheryl, Sharon seemed really scared of Mark. Then on the night before Sharon's murder, Mark had attended his friend Derek's birthday party. And after the party, Mark told Derek that he was planning to meet up with Sharon Gregory and two other friends. And it's actually still not known if that meetup really happened or not. The two other friends who remained anonymous did not publicly confirm that they had met up with Mark that night, but it is thought that this is what happened. But unfortunately, we have no details on what happened that night. If they did actually meet up, we don't know if there was some sort of argument or disagreement between Sharon and Mark. We just still don't know. So the next morning on October 24th, 1988, the day of the murder, Cheryl and Sharon's parents leave early for work and then Cheryl heads out to school at about 8.45, leaving the front door unlocked. And Sharon is home alone getting ready for the day. Now, while this is going on, Mark is with his friend, Scott Landry. Mark had asked Scott to give him a ride to his counseling session that morning at the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Center. Mark's car was low on fuel that day and his air conditioner wasn't really working properly. So he had asked Scott if he would bring him to a session. So Scott agreed and he dropped Mark off at the session a little after eight o'clock and then he picked him back up at 9 a.m. After that, they headed over to Mark's house to take a look at the air conditioner in his car. Then they got back into Scott's car and headed over to Scott's house just to hang out. Then just after 10 o'clock a.m., as Mark and Scott are just sitting around watching MTV, Scott gets a frantic phone call from Sharon Gregory. She's having car troubles. She can't get her car to start and she really needs to get to class. And she's tried to call her boyfriend to see if he could give her a ride, but he didn't answer. And so now she's in a panic. She's in tears. So she's like, you know, do you have a car available right now? Can you please give me a ride to school? I'm desperate. But Scott says, I'm sorry, I don't have access to a car at the moment. I can't give you a ride. Now, I'm not sure why Scott told her that he didn't have access to a car. He had been driving around with Mark all morning, but he had been driving his dad's truck. So maybe his dad was using the truck at the time that she called. I don't really know. But whatever the case, Scott tells Sharon that he doesn't have access to a car at the moment, but he does offer her some advice on how to get her car started. And then they hang up. And after Scott hangs up, Mark asks Scott who he had been talking to. And Scott says, oh, that was Sharon Gregory her car won't start and she needs a ride to school. And then Mark asks, well, why can't her parents or her sister take her to school? Is she home alone? And Scott's like, yeah, she's home alone. She doesn't have anyone to bring her to school. Her parents are at work and Cheryl's at school. And then Mark just sits there quietly for a few minutes. And then he suddenly stands up and goes into another room and he's gone for several minutes. And when he returns, Scott asks him what he had been doing. And Mark just says, oh, I was just making a phone call. And he didn't elaborate. Then he says, you know what? I need to go pick up my paycheck at the stop and shop. And I think I'll just take my car down there. So can you give me a ride home real quick? So Scott says, you know, sure, no problem. And they get into Scott's dad's truck and Scott drops Mark off at his house so that he can go get his check. But Mark never goes to the stop and shop to get his check. He was finally going to live out his sadistic fantasy. Based on the evidence that was later found and eyewitness accounts, this is what happened after Scott dropped Mark off at his house. Instead of going to pick up his check from the stop and shop, Mark went inside of his house up to his room and put on his J. 
Jason clothes. He grabbed one of his mini hockey masks and one of his mini knives and he walked out of his house, climbed into his car, a gray Chevrolet Chevette, and he headed towards the Gregory home. Based on an eyewitness account from a neighbor of the Gregory's, a gray Chevrolet Chevette had pulled up into the Gregory's home close to noon. The neighbor would later describe the driver as a young man with dark hair who looked to be about six feet tall and around 180 pounds dressed all in denim. And of course, this was Mark. Mark then opened the unlocked front door of the Gregory home, walked inside, put on his mask, pulled out his knife, and then started looking for his victim. And he eventually found Sharon. And I cannot even imagine how terrifying this must have been for her. Not only was there an intruder in her home, but this person is dressed like Jason Voorhees. This had to have been unimaginably terrifying for Sharon. Mark then started stabbing Sharon over and over again, likely near the foot of the stairs. It's thought that Sharon attempted to escape and she ran up the stairs towards the bathroom, but Mark caught up with her and he continued his attack. He stabbed her all over her face, all over the back of her head, on her chest and her back, and then he slit her throat. He absolutely mutilated Sharon. Mark then put Sharon's body into the bathtub. He removed his mask and then he calmly walked out of the house, climbed back into his car and drove away. And based on that same neighbor's account, Mark left the house less than five minutes after he arrived. It had taken him less than five minutes to murder Sharon. Then about 30 minutes after the murder, Cheryl arrived home from school and she walked into a house of horrors. Now, like I said, Cheryl initially thought that Sharon might have killed herself. She was so freaked out in the moment, murder did not come to mind. So when she first called for help, she said she thought her sister had killed herself. And somehow news that a suicide had occurred at the Gregory house gets out and Scott Landry hears about it from his mother. But his mother doesn't have details. She just heard that one of the Gregory twins had taken her own life. And she told her son Scott right away because she knew that he was friends with both of these girls. And Scott was probably in total disbelief. He had just seen Sharon and Cheryl. He had actually just spoken to Sharon on the phone. So Scott gets in his car and he tracks down Cheryl's boyfriend, Peter, and Sharon's boyfriend, Chris. And he tells them that one of their girlfriends has taken her own life, but he didn't know which one it was, which is just so sad. And then to later find out that it wasn't a suicide, it was actually a brutal murder. I just cannot imagine receiving news like that. But back at the crime scene, police can immediately tell that this was definitely a homicide and it was an extremely violent one at that. And Cheryl starts telling police all about Mark and how scared Sharon had become of him recently. And so they headed over to Mark's house. Now, when they knock on the front door, Mark's mother answers and police tell her that they're looking for Mark and they're asking, you know, is he here? And she says, I've seen him today, but he's not here at the moment. I haven't seen him since earlier this morning. He's been out with his friend, Scott Landry. So they go talk to Scott and he tells them, yes, we were together this morning, but I dropped him off at his house sometime around 11 a.m. so that he could go pick up his check from the stop and shop. So then police go to the stop and shop and start asking questions. And they tell police that Mark never arrived to pick up his check that day. They also check with some other family and friends, but no one had seen Mark or his car. Mark had just vanished. And at this point, he is their only person of interest. Cheryl also tells police about that psychological profile that Mark had asked her to return a few days earlier. And so police go up to Cheryl's room and search for it, but it was gone. It had been sitting on Cheryl's floor for two months and now it was just gone. And they thought that this could not be a coincidence. An autopsy was performed on Sharon and it was determined that she had been stabbed at least 24 times with a sharp object that was about four to five inches long. She was stabbed in the face, the back of her head, her back, her chest, and her throat had been cut. This was overkill for sure. So they started to interview the people that are in Mark's social circle to see if they can figure out why Mark would want to target Sharon. And during Scott Landry's interview, he tells investigators that Mark had recently told him that he was very angry with Cheryl and Sharon Gregory because they had been making fun of him and teasing him. And he was also upset that Cheryl and Sharon still had that psychological profile. Police from all over the area were on the lookout for Mark's gray Chevrolet Chevette. And on October 25th, one day after the murder, a woman called from the town of Buckland, Massachusetts, which is not far from Greenfield, maybe like 30 minutes away. And she said that there was an abandoned car parked right by a heavily wooded area in Buckland and it fit the description of Mark's car. And police confirmed that this is in fact Mark's car. And when they searched it, they found blood everywhere on the steering wheel, the parking brake, the doors, the seats, there was blood all over the place. A search party combed through the wooded area near where the car was found, hoping to find Mark, but nothing turned up. And based on the amount of blood that they found in the car and 
all the other information that they had at this point, it was pretty much decided that Mark was the killer. It couldn't be a coincidence that the day that someone from his social circle was murdered, Mark vanishes and his car is found with blood everywhere. So they get a search warrant for Mark's house and when they go into his room, they immediately notice how clean and organized everything was. They even commented that Mark's room looked like it was something out of good housekeeping. Everything had its proper place, everything was very organized and folded neatly, but once they began to dig through Mark's stuff, that's when they started to uncover all of his horror movie collection, his horror figures, costumes, posters, tons of weapons, including several knives, and a machete. They also found six hockey masks like the one that Jason wears in the Friday the 13th movies. But Mark's friends had already told police that he had seven hockey masks. So one is missing. And when police saw Mark's horror collection, they were in shock. In their minds, this was the final piece of the puzzle. Any person who was this obsessed with scary movies had to be capable of committing murders, which is of course ridiculous, but this was the mindset. All of this information was released to the town of Greenfield and when the media found out about Mark's obsession with horror movies and Jason in particular, they really ran with it. They were blaming the movies, blaming the horror industry as a whole. In their minds, this murder would never have happened if Friday the 13th had never been created. And the townspeople were so paranoid. They were seeing Mark everywhere. He was around every corner, hiding behind every tree, lurking in the dark. The police department was receiving tons of calls about potential Mark sightings. They received over 3,000 hysterical phone calls during the search, people in an absolute panic claiming that they had spotted Mark Branch. It was literally as if the boogeyman had descended on Greenfield and every person in town was living in constant fear. And police had to follow up on every single lead, but they always ended up nowhere. Local officials even ordered the movie theaters in town to stop showing the movie Halloween 4, which had just come out in theaters. So they stopped showing that because they were worried that it could potentially inspire more murders. Officials even even advised people not to let their kids go out trick-or-treating on Halloween night. So instead, the town collectively decided to celebrate on the Sunday before Halloween, and they did all the trick-or-treating early in the afternoon so that it was still daylight. People who had always slept with their doors unlocked were locking them and even adding security systems. Parents were no longer letting their children go outside and play, walk around, ride their bikes. Basically, everyone was just on lockdown. This had the town going absolutely crazy with fear. And the police were so desperate to find Mark that they even started working with a well-known psychic named John Monty. And during John Monty's search of the area where Mark's car was found, he and the police discovered an old abandoned slaughterhouse. And inside there was graffiti all over the walls, lots of dark things related to horror movies. But what really caught their eye was a drawing on the wall depicting a woman running up some stairs with a masked man chasing her up the stairs with a knife. And this was basically what had happened to Sharon. So police thought that Mark could have actually been in the slaughterhouse at some point, but no trace of him was found. Now this was all happening during deer hunting season and this was a town full of hunters. So police were hoping that if Mark was hiding out in the woods, one of the hunters would end up finding him. And a lot of the guys who were headed out into the woods could be heard saying that if they found Mark hiding in the woods, they planned to kill him right there on the spot. And one of these hunters was a man named Kevin Purinton. And on November 29th, 1988, over a month after the murder, Kevin headed out into the woods to do some deer hunting. And as he was slowly walking through the quiet woods, he heard the sound of a tree branch cracking right above his head. And when he looked up, he saw Mark Branch dead, hanging from a tree, dressed from head to toe as Jason Voorhees, mask and all. Mark had hung himself from the tree using shoelaces and a belt. And he was only about a mile away from where his car had been discovered. But because the leaf coverage was so thick at that time, no one saw him during the initial search. It was later determined that Mark had been dead for several days. He had likely fled to the woods right after he killed Sharon and immediately hung himself. So he likely died on the same day as the murder. And that was it. It was case closed. But the people of Greenfield were not satisfied with the limited information that they had about Mark Branch. They were relieved that he was gone and that he was no longer a threat to the town, but they wanted to know more about him and they wanted to know why Sharon Gregory, why had he chosen her? Very little information was given by the family and friends about Mark and about a potential motive, but police did eventually release a little more information on a possible motive. But honestly, this just leads to more questions. 
They said that there is a chance that Sharon had used that psychological profile that Mark had given Cheryl to create her own psychological profile of him for her psychology class. And Mark had just gotten really upset when he read Cheryl's report. But there is a lot of conflicting information out there about this. Some sources say that the profile in question was actually just the professional one that was done in the psychiatric hospital when Mark was in high school. And a couple of sources say that the report that Mark wanted back was the one that Sharon had created, but she was refusing to give it to him. So there is still a lot of mystery surrounding the details of Sharon's murder. And following this case, there were several theories that circulated around about why this all happened in the first place. And one of the more popular ones was that Sharon and Mark were both part of a satanic cult. But this was all happening at the height of the satanic panic. So it's not really surprising that this was one of the more popular theories. Other people blamed the whole thing on the failed mental health system. Mark had been in and out of various mental health facilities for 15 years and he spoke openly about his fascination with murder and all of his dark fantasies and he made countless threats. He was obviously a danger to society but he was always released with no conditions. After the discovery of Mark's body the Gregory and Branch families actually did come together to support each other because at the end of the day both families had lost a child and they were all in mourning and they were all just trying to wrap their heads around what had happened and it it's a shame that Mark went out the way he did because he took the answers to so many questions with him. Like, why was Sharon chosen? Had Mark been planning to kill her and he just finally saw his opportunity? Or maybe there was no real reason. Maybe Mark really did just want to live out his fantasy that he had been thinking about for years. And that was the case of Mark Branch and the Friday the 13th copycat murder. Let me know what you guys think about this one down in the comments. Don't forget that you can use my link to try out Factor for yourself and get 50% off. That link will be in my description box and pinned in a comment. If you find this type of content interesting, please consider subscribing to my channel and following me on Instagram at summer underscore Sanchez YT. And as always, I appreciate each and every one of you for watching. I hope you all have a great Halloween night and I will see you next time.